and to just engage in that worship, that standing firm on the truth and the promise of God, that our faith can move mountains, that things that look so giant are nothing for him. He's never confused about what to do. He's never out of sorts trying to handle it all. He's big and great and strong and just the most amazing, the most amazing power and life giver there is. The creator of the universe who loves us. 
Welcome to Faith Church. We're so glad you're joining us. We are going to continue in worship this morning. We know this truth about God. The enemy runs in the name of Jesus. Amen? Join us in worship.
praise you for who you are. We praise you that in you alone, we find our strength. We find our new life. We find our robes of righteousness, the love, the right standing with you. It comes from you. And you freely give it to us, God. We thank you for that. We thank you that in Christ alone, we can find our refuge and our strength and our peace. Thank you for that love.
Good morning again. Um, I just want to officially welcome you and um, invite you to fill out our digital connection card. It's at wearefaithchurch.com. It's just a great way for us to get to know who you are, to be praying for you. You can submit, um, you know, if you want to get plugged in somehow. It's a great way for us to connect with you. And uh, we'd love you to do that, uh, if you would. And we also have a couple of announcements for you today. Uh, We have a praise and worship gathering. Um that is going to be put on by our prayer ministry here. And it's going to be September 23rd. It's a Thursday night at 7.15. We are going to have a time of prayer and a time of worship and testimony and just sharing how God is moving. And it's just, I know some of the people that are sharing their testimonies. It's going to be an amazing night to hear how God is moving in individual lives. And he's in our details. And so we just want to, it's open to everyone. Um, It's a free event that we're doing. We are partnering with Wellsprings of Freedom, who we work with uh, through the prayer ministry. And so we'd love you to let us know if you want to come to that. Um, You can do it on the connection card at wearefaithchurch.com, or you can email us at hello at wearefaithchurch.com and let us know that you're coming. Um, We hope to see you there. So um, another thing, and this is for our online audience only, we are starting our live stream next week. We are launching it, so we will have two service times at 9 and 11, just like we do here in person, and it's going to be the exact same service live stream to you. We are very excited to launch this, and um, Jacob has been working super hard. He's amazing, and he's getting everything rolling uh, for us with that. So we're excited to have you join us live in person this way um, as you tune in online. So. Um, And then the last thing is just thank you for giving. We love you, and we couldn't do what we do here without all of you. Um, So thank you for giving of your time and your prayers and your resources um, to put into Faith Church so that we can reach the world, really, one person at a time through our community and then through our global partnerships as well. Um, God, we just give you this morning. We love you and we praise your name and we thank you for using us and using Faith Church to be a beacon of your light. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. At Rephidim, Amalek came and fought against Israel. Moses said to Joshua, select some men for us and go fight against Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the hilltop with God's staff in my hand. Joshua did as Moses had told him and fought against Amalek while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. While Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed, but whenever he put his hand down, Amalek prevailed. When Moses' hands grew heavy, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat down on it. Then Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and one on the other, so that his hands remained steady until the sun went down. So Joshua defeated Yeah, so about that. Um, I, this morning, I, I'm up here to tackle a couple of different things, but, but our whole series is called About That. We want to, first of all, welcome you uh, to, our, to our online service. Thank you for joining us this morning. I'm super excited. My name is Sam Anderson. I'm the youth pastor here. I'm super excited to be joining you this morning because I want to talk about something in particular, and it has to do with that verse we just talked about, but that's kind of our landing point, so we got to backtrack to the beginning, but what I want to talk about this morning is the staff of God. In that verse, it talks about the staff of God. Moses talks about the staff of God, and and this staff is something that I've just keyed in on. I've always loved this this story, but but the staff of God is something that's always seemed so interesting to me, this this idea of the staff. Um, And so so this morning, I would just love to dive in and to talk about that and so before I really jump in, there's a couple of things I want to talk about. Number one is like the backstory of like what, what this staff is, where it comes from, how we got here. And I'm just giving you a preface. I'm going to run through a bunch of stories around the staff. So just follow along with that. But then we're going to get to that landing point of that verse you just heard. And, and the, the, one of the things that I wanted to hit at the front, I'm going to talk about it in the middle and talk about it again at the end, is that the staff is simply 
a, a staff. It's not some kind of magical, powerful, all-being, all-knowing staff. Like, God didn't put his magical powers on this staff. We'll get more into that. But I wanted to say that up front because it's, it's while I'm taking the topic of the staff and really focusing in on the staff, that's actually a lot more to it. I'm actually going to be talking a lot more about how God interacts with his people, and the staff is a signifier of him interacting with his people. So before I really dive in, let's jump into the backstory of the staff. What is this staff? Well, in order to know what this staff is, we have to go back and we have to look at Moses in Egypt, okay? So, so last, week, uh, last week, we were going to talk about <laughs> Moses' mother, but, but Pastor Kirk called an audible, which was great. I thought that was amazing. But last week, um, we were going to talk about Moses. So let me just give you a quick backstory of Moses. Moses was born as a, as a baby in Egypt to, a, to the Hebrews who were slaves there. And, and God told his mother to put him in a basket and send him down the river because at the time, the Pharaoh had heard a prophet of, of a young boy who was going to come and overthrow him. And so he was out here just killing all the young babies, right? So he sends Moses down, or Moses' mother sends him down the river in this basket, and he gets picked up by an Egyptian princess, by, the, by I believe it's the daughter of the Pharaoh. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Read the story. I don't remember off the top of my head. But he gets picked up, and he's actually born in, he's actually raised, not born, but raised, in the Pharaoh's household in Egypt. So what happens is Moses is brought up around this, this uh, Egyptian culture in the Egyptian religion. So he, for all intents and purposes, outside of who he actually is, is an Egyptian. What ends up happening is that he learns that he is actually from the Hebrew people. So he's spending some time down there learning about the Hebrew people. And while he's down there, he sees an Egyptian man beating a Hebrew slave. And he ends up killing the Egyptian, burying him in the sand. And then when, when he finds out that other people saw him do this, he thought he did it in, the, in secrecy and nobody would know. When other people saw him do this, he actually runs from Egypt. He flees the Egyptian kingdom. He flees and ends up out in a land called Midian. Now, while he's out there, he, he stumbles upon this well where there's some young ladies who are drawing water for their father's flocks, and he helps them. And her father invites him back to, 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 for dinner and to spend time. Long story short, I'm sure there's a lot more backstory, but the, the verses are actually pretty jump along. They jump along rather quickly. Long story short, he ends up marrying one of these young ladies, and then, his father, and then the young lady's father, he is the, the, um, the, the priest of Midian, Jethro, ends up taking him on and, and puts him out as a shepherd for the flocks, for his flocks. So it's in this moment where we, be, where we first can imply Moses gets the, the staff of God or his shepherd's staff. All of that story, backstory, is just to show you how Moses came to acquire the staff. He just, he became a shepherd, so he needed a shepherd's staff. What is the importance of the shepherd's staff? That's the question I, I always wonder. Like what, when, when we're talking about shepherds, why is the staff so important? Why, we always see the pictures of the shepherd's crooks. What, what, what did they do with them? What was the importance of them? And, and I was doing some research on this, and I found that the staff actually has three key functions and purposes for the shepherd. And the first one, believe it or not, is balance. It's simply a walking stick when they're going across treacherous terrain, when they're going through some places where the sheep can easily walk, but maybe we can't. It's simply to balance and to help the shepherd walk along with the flock. That's the first the purpose of the staff. The second is to help guide and correct the flock. So he can use the staff and the hook on the staff to help move the sheep around, to help keep them going in the right direction, to turn them, to push them, maybe to scold them. I, they use the staff to help guide the sheep in the proper direction that they're headed. And the third was actually as a weapon to defend the flock. So the, the shepherd would use this staff to, to help them, help the sheep, and also defend the sheep. So when they're in the wilderness and there's animals and random assailants coming towards them, this, the shepherd could use the staff as a weapon to defend them himself and the flock of sheep, right? I think that the, 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 <laughs> the shepherd's staff and the useful, the reason, like the, the, the purposes of it are kind of some foreshadowing in the next number of stories as to how God is going to interact with the Israelite people. And I think it's really amazing. But I wanted to talk about that staff before we really dive in. Let's jump in to the first story now. We know, about, we know a little bit of Moses, how he got the staff. It's literally just a tool that he got because he's a shepherd. And now he's out here shepherding the flock. And now let's really dive in and start to see 
the specialness of this staff and what ends up happening with this staff. The first story, Moses is out guiding his flock through the wilderness and he stumbles across this cave and in this cave he finds the burning bush. The burning, now this is, for those of you who don't know, this story in and of itself could probably be could probably be a whole about that sermon because Moses finds this bush that is on fire and it doesn't go out and it's, it's actually an angel of the Lord who calls him in and as he comes closer, all of a sudden he hears the voice of God and he begins to cover his face because he's like, I don't, God, I know, I don't really know who you are. He grew up Egypt, he grew up Egyptian and now he's a Hebrew and he's realizing, he's still learning the culture. He's like, I don't really know what's going on. Um, and God's like, take your shoes off. This is holy ground. And this is his whole story of his first interaction with God. But what's, what's happening here is God is calling Moses out of his ordinary shepherd life into his calling that he had set him aside for in the beginning. So what God is doing is asking Moses to come into Egypt and to free the Hebrew people from slavery there and take them to the promised land. Now Moses reacts with some concerns, with some, with some uneasiness. He's not, he's not sure that he's ready for this or that he's the one or that this is really what he should be doing at all or anything like that. And Moses is protesting. This is actually his second protest. We're jumping right into the middle of the story. And he says, what if they won't believe me or listen to me? What if I tell them who you are and they don't believe me? What if they say, the Lord has never appeared to you? Question mark Because he doesn't physically see the Lord. He just sees the, the, the burning bush and, and hears his voice. Then the Lord asked him, what is that in your hand? hand. A shepherd's staff, Moses replied. Throw it down on the ground, the Lord told him. So, so Moses threw the staff down, and it turned into a snake, and Moses jumped back. The first thing I want to pull out of this first that I really want to key in on is this line right here. A shepherd's staff, Moses replied. God, he's, he's asking God, what is, how do I know? How do I convince them? What if they don't believe me? And God says, I know what we'll do. I know exactly how we can get them to believe you. He says, what is that in your hand? He asks Moses for the thing, the one possession that he has, that he's in the field with right now, and it's, it's simply a shepherd's staff. He says, a shepherd's staff. And the first thing I wanted to key in on this, and the reason we talked about the shepherd's staff, is that to a shepherd, that tool is pretty important. But to anybody else who's looking at the shepherds or who sees a shepherd, it looks like a, a curvy stick. It doesn't even look like a good straight walking stick. It's a curvy stick. It's nothing special. When God asks Moses, what's in your hand? It is nothing special. It is the most ordinary plane. It's just a stick. It's a shepherd's staff, Moses replies. The thing I wanted to key on, in, to key on here first is that God is asking for something ordinary in Moses' life. He's not asking him to go and retrieve a ton of things. He's not asking him to be a better person. He's not asking him to to. to, to Whatever. He's, he's simply looking at what he has in his life right now. And he says, give me your ordinary. And he works a miracle with it. Throw it on the ground and it becomes a snake. I'm going to get to the snake part in a minute. But I wanted to key on this. God wants your ordinary for his glory. God is going to use this ordinary thing from Moses' life, a simple tool in Moses' life, but he's going to use it for his glory, for many, many years to come, for many, many stories to come. And we're going to try to cover a bunch of them today. But God wants your ordinary for his glory. Some of the hardest things that I'm trying to key in on when it comes to talking about the staff, we're really looking at the staff, but the staff is more than just a stick. It's a signifier of God interacting with the Israelites. And I want to focus today on, how, on what that means for us, how God's interactions with the Israelites affect us. And the first one is this. God wants your ordinary for his glory. Now, the end of that verse, I'll back up really quick. The end of that verse, it talks about, it turns into a snake. And now when I read that, I was like, all right, cool. God did this amazing miracle. He turned the staff into a snake. But, but why? Why a snake? What is the importance of a snake? Other than maybe it's like dangerous. And then he tells Moses to pick it back up by his tail and it turns back into a staff. I, I'm trying to figure out, I'm, I'm reading and I'm like, what is the importance? I did some studying and I found out that the snake is actually a symbol of a god in the Egyptian culture. And it was the god of the Egyptian land. So what God is doing is he's turning the staff into a snake. And then we find out later, Moses goes to the pharaohs goes to the Pharaoh, and he brings his staff, and he tells him to let his people go. And Pharaoh's kind of like, you and what army? Like, who's, who, where, where are you receiving the power to come to me like this? And he does this miracle. He throws the staff on the ground, and it becomes a snake. Immediately, Pharaoh takes his sorcerers, and he says, 
replicate this. And the sorcerers do. They take their staffs and they throw them on the ground and they become snakes, right? So initially in this, in this interaction with the Pharaoh sorcerers, it looks like God's power isn't necessarily greater, but might maybe equal to the sorcerers. But then what happens next in the story is the second key thing that I wanted to focus in on. What happens is the snake that God turned this Moses' staff into eats the other snakes. And Moses picks back up the staff. You see, it's this little bit of symbolism, but it shows if the snake is a symbol of the Egyptian God, God has turned his staff into a snake and has eaten the other snakes. The key thing I wanted to focus in on is God has the power over the enemies that you're going to face. God has the power over the troubles that you're going to face. God is more powerful. God is more powerful than the troubles that the Israelites were going to face, and he is more powerful than the troubles that you're going to face. We're moving quickly this morning. I got a bunch more stories. We're going to keep on moving. After after some time, some plagues, some some difficulty, finally Pharaoh says, take the the Hebrew people and go. Get out of here. And so they're fleeing the Egyptian land and they're heading into the desert, which is the pathway to the promised land. And as they're heading there, they come across the Red Sea. The Red Sea is a a, a large sea and they're not sure how they're going to get through or get around and they come to find out that the, that the Pharaoh had changed his mind and the Egyptian soldiers are actually chasing them after them, coming to capture them again. And they get to the sea and the Israelites look at Moses and they start to complain and they start to yell and they start to shout, life was better in Egypt instead of on the run. We're going to die out here in the wilderness thanks to you. You're not listening to us. You're not doing what we need. We should have just stayed back there. And Moses says, don't worry. God's going to save us. The next verse Exodus 14, 15 and 16, the next verse, the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the people to get moving. Pick up your staff and raise your hand over the sea. Divide the water so the Israelites can walk through the middle of the sea on dry ground. Moses is running and he's crying out to God and he's saying, God, save us. He doesn't say prior to that that he's crying out, but then God says, why are you crying out to me? So I can imagine Moses has all of these Hebrews behind him saying, what are you doing? You've led us to death. Now we're all going to die. We should have just stayed slaves. And I can see Moses being like, God, what do I do? I'm so confused. I don't understand. What's next for us? Help us, God. And God says, pick up the staff. Put your hand out over the sea. It seems like a lost cause, but I'm going to split it and you're going to walk across on dry ground. Y'all, this story right here, this story right here, when you might seem lost, this is, how, this is what I get from this story, right? The, the, the power of God interacting, interacting with the Israelite people being denoted by this, by this staff, the power of God, when you are backed into a corner, he's going to make a way. For the Israelite people, when they were backed into a corner, he made a way. When you are backed into a corner, he's going to make a way. I know we're moving fast this morning. I hope y'all are having a good morning. You got your coffee ready. You got your notes out. I'm moving quickly. I'm trying to get to this final story where we're going to land. But next, I have, I have another story before we land on that final story. This story, they're into the wilderness now. They, they run through the Red Sea. The sea collapses in on the, on the Egyptian army. So they know nobody's chasing them. And now they're going into the wilderness, into this vast desert. And they're going to be there for a number of years. They're going to be there for quite some time. And they're walking around and God is guiding them through the desert and he's taking them around in circles and circles. And, and, and they seem, they're getting frustrated and lost. And numerous times the Israelites are complaining to Moses and God is providing for them. They're complaining to Moses and God is providing to them. And on this particular occasion, on this particular occasion, the Israelites are, are dying of thirst. They tell Moses, we're dying of thirst. You've led us out into this world. This is, we're going to die. They say that a lot to Moses. They were, you let us out here and we're going to die. And God steps in again. And the Lord said to Moses, walk out in front of the people. Take your staff, the one you use when you struck the water of the Nile, and call some of the elders of Israel to join you. I will stand before you on the rock at Mount Sinai. Strike the rock and water will come gushing out. Then the people will be able to drink. So Moses struck the rock as he was told and water gushed out as the elders looked on. 
The first thing that I notice right away is he says, take some elders with you. He performs this miracle. He does what God tells him to do. He strikes the rock with the staff. Water comes out and the elders looked on. So number one, God is convincing not just Moses, not just the people, but he's convincing the leaders of the Israelites to listen to Moses, to follow Moses. But what, what really keys off for me is that they've been walking through this desert and it's, they're thirsty, they're hungry, they're lost. They think they're gonna die. And God takes the ordinary staff and he says, Moses, you have this thing that I have given you. You've, I've shown my power from so many times before. Take that staff and strike that rock and I will provide water for my people. Y'all, in this story, God takes something ordinary and makes something extraordinary, makes a miracle. I wanted to remind you all this morning, as I read this story, I was reminded that God will provide in my desert. And I wanted to remind you this morning that God has given you the things that you need and he will provide for you in your desert. Y'all, there's a lot of lessons to take from these stories about this staff, but I'm coming up into the last one and it's the one I really wanted to land on for today. It's the one that I think is really important. It's the one that ultimately I think... um, our church needed to hear this Sunday. And it's the story that we heard at the beginning, but I'm going to read it through again and walk through it. And it says, While the people of Israel were still at Rephidim, the warriors of Amalek attacked them. Moses commanded Joshua, Choose some men to go out and fight the army of Amalek for us. Tomorrow I will stand at the top of the hill, holding the staff of God in my hand. Right away, they're, getting, they're facing some assailants. They're facing some people who want to come down and destroy the Israelites on their way to the promised land. And Moses says, go out and defend us. Go out and fight them. I will take the staff of God and I will raise it in my hand. So Joshua did what Moses had commanded and fought the army of Amalek. Meanwhile, Moses, Aaron, and Hur. Climb Aaron and Hur are very tight, close friends of Moses. They're like Moses, they're like Moses' right-hand men, right? They climb to the top of a nearby hill. As long as Moses held the staff up in his hand, the Israelites had the advantage. But whenever he dropped his hand, the Amalekites gained the advantage. So what we're seeing here is that when Moses goes to the top of the hill and he raises the staff... God intervenes in their war. God intervenes in their fight. God begins to give them the advantage in their fight. They begin to win. This is the part that I want to key in on. Moses' arms soon became tired, so tired that he could no longer hold them up. So Aaron and Hur found a stone for him to sit on. They stood on either side of Moses, holding up his hands, so his hands held steady until sunset. As a result, Joshua overwhelmed the army of Amalek in battle. The lesson to be learned from this story is that his power will go before you and that the victory is won in surrender and prayer. Let me unpack that really quickly. God fights for us in our surrender and prayer. Let me unpack this. You see, when Moses went to the top of the hill, he began by just raising the staff of God, similar to many of the other miracles that he did. But what he ends up doing, his arm gets tired, and while he's holding the staff, they have the advantage, and when he puts it down because his arm is tired, they begin to lose the advantage. But what ends up happening is that he becomes so tired that he needs the people around him to hold his hands up. There's there's so many lessons to learn from this. I'm getting there, trust me. He begins to hold his hands up. There's a shift between I'm holding this with my hand and I'm holding my hands up. This is where, I'll come back to this in one second, this is where our so what moment comes in. So what? What's the purpose of this story? What's the point of this story? In my study around this story, I found out that the staff often represents how God interacts in the lives of Israelites. I've been saying that from the beginning. The staff isn't magical or powerful or even special, but it's a signifier of God's interaction with the Israelites. The staff is often tied to many interactions where God has stepped in to help the Israelites. However, in the final story, we see a shift with the staff that is so significant. It begins with Moses holding the staff up with one hand, as he has done many times before. 
Here he is saying that he will go and hold the staff of God and God will intervene and fight the battle. But at some point there is a shift where the focus is no longer on the staff, but rather on the hand position of Moses. And not just one hand holding the staff, but both hands, two hands being raised. This is a common description in the New Test or in the Old Testament of, of prayer and worship. And in many other ancient texts, this same idea of raising both hands is, an, is, is, a, is a, a picture of prayer and worship. Moses shifts from wielding the power of the staff to a place of surrender to God. It's when we surrender control of our situation, when we surrender the power of the staff, when we surrender the control of the situation, but even when we surrender the ordinary things in our lives, when we do that, God comes to fight our battles. The magical thing about the end, about this shift is that we're beginning to see that it has nothing to do with the staff at all. The staff in the beginning was, was God asking Moses to be obedient to him, but at some point he shifts. Moses shifts, and we see that it's no longer about obedience with the staff, but it's more about surrender. It's more about Moses giving everything he has over to God. You see, I, I heard this somewhere that the, the two hands up is often is a universal symbol for I give up, for surrendering. Two hands up, right? When you put your hands up, you can't grab for your weapons, you can't defend yourself, your hands up, you're surrendering. What's happening here is Moses is moving to a place of surrender. He's moving to a place of taking his leadership and the power that God has given him through that staff and surrendering it over to God. The most beautiful thing in this is that he couldn't do it by himself. He needed Aaron and her to hold his hands up for him. Listen, y'all, some of us are going through some things. Some of us are facing some battles. Some of us are facing some hardships. Our church has been wounded in these last few weeks. Our church has been wounded. We are facing a battle like we've never seen before. But what we can learn from this story is that when we have some Aaron and hers around us and we surrender the ordinary things in our lives over to God, he's going to step in. He's not just going to give us the advantage, but he's going to help us overwhelm, overwhelm in battle against those things in our life. For if you're out there today, listen, if you're out there today, and you feel like you're fighting a battle, Please don't fight it alone. If you're out there today and you feel like, you, like God's not providing, like you're in a tough spot, please don't do it alone. If you're out there today and you're really fighting, jump in the comment section. Fill out a connection card. Connect with us. We want to be your Aaron and her. We want to come beside you. We want to hold your hands up. We want to help you surrender the things over to God so he will step in and win this battle for you. The victory's already been won through Jesus, and we just want to help support you. For those of you out there today who are dealing with some of this pain and struggle and agony that our church has been experiencing over these last few weeks, I want to encourage you that the battle is won in prayer and worship. The battle is not won by you fighting on your own. So after the message today, we're going to jump into a song called Surrender or how I fight my battles, or surrounded, not surrender, surrounded. And this is how I fight my battles. And this, in this song, the, 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 the uh, chorus keeps singing, this is how I fight my battles. And it's an opportunity for you to lift those hands and surrender to Jesus. To lift, to, to, to give him your ordinary, to give him the things, the control, and say, God, I give this to you because I know this is how I fight my battles. Can I pray for us? And Jesus, we just want to say thank you, God. We want to say thank you. Thank you for the fact that we don't have to fight our battles alone. Thank you for the fact that we don't have to fight our battles with our, with our physicality. Thank you for the fact that you go before us to win these battles. 
God, I thank you that, that we can just surrender our lives to you, that we can just love you and adore you, and you will go before us to win these battles. You will provide water in the desert. God, we just thank you. We just thank you for all the amazing miracles that you, that you do in our lives and are going to do in our lives. I pray for the people in our church right now who are really going through some, some battles and some struggles, God. I pray that you would point those people out to us, that we could rally around them and, and lift their arms up and help support them and, and guide them and love them, God. I pray that you would allow us to grow closer together as a family. And I pray that as we begin to surrender our lives over to you and surrender the ordinary in our life over to you, God, that you would show up and do something extraordinary and miraculous. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.
just as Moses was lifting his arms and when he had his arms reached up, reached up to God the Father, he could not lose. The battle was being won. Somebody once said that when you worry about something, you magnify the problem and it becomes a giant and it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. But you know what? When we exalt the name of Jesus, when we lift up God, his presence in our life, he gets bigger and bigger and bigger in our minds and in our hearts and in our realities. We speak it into existence. He's there waiting to fight for us. He's there waiting with open arms for us to run and for him to embrace and for us to rest. So we're gonna end our service with just a little bit of a time focusing on exalting him. I exalt thee, O Lord. Lord, we lift up your name. We lift up who you are. We ask you to magnify and multiply your presence in our life. Lord, fill us up. Surround us in a tangible way. We exalt you today. I exalt thee. I exalt thee. I exalt thee. Oh Lord. I Before we go, we just want to remind you again, September 23rd, it's a Thursday night at 7.15. We're going to meet here for a time of worship and prayer and testimony and hearing how God is working in our lives through our prayer ministry. We'd love to have you join us. Again, let us know if you can make it um, through the connection card at wearefaithchurch.com, and we will see you next week. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.